I've seen it all. I mean, you're not going to tell me much that I don't know. There's some big actors that I've worked with that are, I wouldn't work with them again, you know? I know what I like. You're entitled to like what you like. Just don't talk to me about it. I don't give a shit. Unless you live it, or unless you've done it, you don't have a right to speak it. Do you know much about the uh, the history of Hollywood, Lyle? It's, it's quite fascinating from what I've heard. Um, you know, I know quite a lot. I actually was born, I'm probably one of the only people that was actually born in Hollywood. Um, I was actually born here in Hollywood. And funny thing is, is my office, my new office is, I'm, I'm now at the Hollywood Production Center, which is a very popular studio. Um, I mean, we have Warner Brothers shooting outside right now. We have Machine Gun Kelly was in here yesterday getting fitted for wardrobe or whatever. And, you know, I, I saw him. I didn't even, you know, I don't really follow rock music that much. So the, one of the girls here said, hey, you know who that is? I'm like, no, he's like Machine Gun Kelly. And he said hi to me. I'm like, hey, whatever. You know, <laughs> it's not a, you see it every day. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, I'm not impressed with nobody. But, um, um, so what's really ironic is I grew up about two blocks from my office here and we, my partner, Jason, who's a fabulous, uh, writer and director. Um, we do a lot of in-house, uh, writing and scripting and, uh, development here in, in the offices. And, um, and, uh, he, uh, he was looking for offices for us to rent and, he grew up on the Warner Brothers lot because his father was one of the most famous editors in Hollywood. He actually did all of the uh, Warner Brothers uh, productions. I mean, Lethal Weapon and, you know, all the Schwarzenegger films and pretty much every film out there back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, he, he, was the, he was the editor on. And he, he's retired now. He's actually really tight. He was tight with Dick Donner, who just passed away. Um, fabulous director producer um but what's re re really re ironic was he came to me he's just like hey i found this office i know you want to go to warner on the lot of paramount or what's an office at paramount one time which is down the road about a half a mile from here um he goes but i found this spot i think you're gonna like it so we come over and we look at it. I'm like, you know, it, yeah, dude, it's weird. My, I grew up two blocks away. And then I went to Lacan Junior High for a while before I moved back east, you know. And then my grandmother's buried over here in Hollywood forever, um, a block away also, you know. It's a famous, you know, uh, mortuary or whatever. Where, you know, they do a lot of films in, in Hollywood forever. I don't know if you know that graveyard, but it's pretty famous. Um, so it, it just, it's weird. It's just right. It's just, I came back to my roots, you know, and, and I said, let's take it. So we, we we're here now and we, we love it. It's a great, great building, lots of security. And, and um, LeBron James is actually in this building also. I haven't really ran into him, but he's got a VIP parking next to mine. I got one, he's got one, I got two in front. So um, it's kind of funny, but you know, he's, he's, he's a bigger name than me, I guess in sports, but you know, it is what it is. But, um, you know, it's just cool. It's, it, it's like you're, I'm back at home every day, you know, I, I, you know in my backyard kind of thing. You know? And it, it's, it's cool. You know, we get a lot done here. Um, we have a lot of meetings here. Uh, we just had two, three yesterday. We, used, we, we have about four or five a day, go to lunch, you know, do all that kind of crap, wheel and deal. And see what we can do. You know, we got a lot of stuff going on. I've got my... Um, a docu-series going on, uh, Prisoner's Path, which is about prisoner reform. Um, we've shot in Chicago. Uh, we've been back and forth there about three times. We're going back one, one more time, the 23rd. Um, then we we go. We, we were in New Orleans recently shooting New Orleans version of it. Uh, we'll be going up to Two Rivers, uh, Oregon, 
to Two River State Penitentiary to shoot up there here in the next probably month. And then, and then actually what I'm going to do is I'm supposed to see a rough cut of the first seat, uh, first uh, episode, I'm hoping tomorrow. And uh, from that, we'll just edit up a big trailer, which you'll see down the road online um, or up on the website and, and, and then sell it to like a Netflix or whoever, Amazon, or, you know, whoever, you know, we'll do a bidding more probably. And, you know, at the end of the day, I have my own, uh, I'm a partner at Buyer Network and we're in 115 countries. So I can distribute it myself, but I'd rather take a check from somebody and get some of my money back, you know? Um, wow. I self finance the whole project. Yeah. And we got, you know, as you can see right here, I don't know if you can see it. That's a red helium right there. Um, can you see that camera right here? Yeah. Okay, well, that's a red helium uh, with about a $90,000 Fujiton lens on it. Wow. And that lens right there was the one used in uh, uh, 1917, I believe, the movie um, that they shot. Um, and there's only two of those lenses, and I have one of them. Panavision has one. So it's just sitting there. And then I have, I have uh, we have uh, the new uh, Komodo cameras um, that are hard to get. Um, I actually just went to Red the other day. They invited me to the studio, which is about a mile from me, um, Red uh, Digital. And um, we're going to do some business back and forth. Um, it's exciting. You know, they have a really cool studio over there. I was blown away because I'd never been over there. And they got a screening room and they're producing. There's several uh, uh, Netflix productions going on on the lot. It's, it's kind of a cool thing, you know, we're kind of clicked in here with near everybody and kind of commingling and we're self-sufficient, you know, production company. We can turn key pretty much anything. Um, you probably see that my favorite picture I bought. It's on that wall back there with the, yeah. with, the with that, with the sticky fingers tongue, you know, that's one of one of 15. I got the first one out by risky. He's a famous graffiti artist and, uh, and uh, they had to license that tongue. And after a while, I th he took that down now because I don't know if there was something going on with the queen, but I got, got it like four years ago. So they're not getting it back for me. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it off the, the art wall, you know, at the art art showing. And um, it's one of my favorite pictures, though. I yeah. Was really cool, you know? so, hey, you guys, you don't want another war, do you? <laughs> you know what? I... I I got plenty of guns, so I ain't worried about it, you know. Hey, we can <laughs> take it as it comes. Hey, we can talk about that. So for our friends at home, it's my absolute honor to welcome one of our American brothers onto the podcast. Lyle um, is an award-winning Hollywood producer. Um, I'm not going to go on and on like an Oscar speech now, but we're going to un unravel that as we go in the podcast. But what I this um, one thing I do want to mention is this gentleman produced the best ever show in what I'd say to my son, the whole wide world ever. And that is the Dukes of Hazard. Well, I got to clarify that. I was I was just one of many, many, many producers and I only produced a few, I, what I did was I actually raised some money for it, which is called an executive producer, co-executive producer. But that was back at the beginning of my career, which is, you know, I, I went from acting to that. And and probably the last movie I ever was in where I had the actual lines was uh, Weekend at Bernie's 2. I don't know if you ever saw it, but I was a New York cop in the subway. The first one was better. The first one was the best one. The second one kind of, hey, you know, it was a lot of money and it was kind of a bomb, but I was in it, and that was the last time I really acted. I mean, I've done cameos in my own films. Uh, I think the last one was 2016. And, you know, you'll see me in some of the docu series here that we're doing, the new one. Um, but other than that, I, I really don't care about that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I think what's more important than producing Dukes of Hazard is, did you get to meet Catherine Bach? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean that was was she every was, was everybody in love. I think with that was every guy's dream back then, you know. 
Um, I, I, I actually briefly met her and then I met her um, out because, you know, I'd been to quite a few red carpet things, stuff, stuff of that nature. I met her out once or twice and that's it. I, I really, I haven't seen her for years and years and years, but um, in fact, way back since then. So I, I don't really, you know, I know that, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, God, I just blanked on the actor. Uh, Is it one the of the boys? Huh? No, one the of the blonde, boys? The, yeah, the, the, I, I blanked on his name. He's actually doing films. He's, he's actually just did a film with a friend of mine, Mindy, Mindy Roberts. Is that um, John Schneider? Yeah, John Snyder. There you go. Yeah. And John, I blanked on him. I'm just getting old. No, no, no. I, hey, I... No, I blank now on like my oh, best friends. I tell you what, as you get older, it's just, you know, it, 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 and I try to stay active in my mind because I'm pretty active, but it's just that uh, there's so much. And so that goes back so far that I just, it, I don't even think about it. It's like, yep. you know, water under the bridge, so to say. Um, he's actually active. He's doing a couple uh, of films and a good friend of mine, Mindy Robertson is, is in them. She's, she's actually uh, Randy Couture's girlfriend. And uh, he's a sweet guy. Randy Couture is a really nice guy. I've worked with him uh, on on a project. And um, he's been on a set of mine that Mindy was on uh, back in 216. But, um, yeah, he's still – Snyder's still going at it, man. He's still making movies, you know. So And he's got the – he owns the, the orange uh, 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 general, the car, you know. Wow. He's got yeah, he still has it, yeah. Oh, we – I love that series. When I was yeah. a kid, every Saturday, I can't remember. I think it was it was shown always around about. Yeah, well, it was a it was a good show. It was a good show that you know, like you know, the women were good looking, and you know, it was fun to look at. It was just a fun fun show. You know, it was a a, a kick in the butt. You know, mm -hmm. you know, Hog and you know some of those characters were just funny as hell. You know. They look like really nice people. They, uh, oh, yeah, no. I mean, you know, you <clears throat> on set, and I'm sure you know, uh, I've been on a, a lot of them. Over, I've probably produced, been involved in over 150 productions now. And um, you get your good people and you get your bad people. And you kind of just take it as a grain of salt. And you learn who to work with and who not to work with. And, it, you know, it, it ain't a big deal. You know, uh, there, there's some big actors that I've worked with that are, I wouldn't work with them again, you know, and uh, just they, I'm one of those guys. I'm one of those producers because I come from a uh, kind of a, I'll, I'll say a hard background where I was a foster kid growing up and um, I'm a self-made guy and, and raised two sons to the adults. And uh, it, actually one was over here yesterday, my older one, he's a good kid. He's actually just gotten in the uh, effects union here in California, which is hard to do. So I use him uh, as much as I can, but uh, he's got his own thing going, you know, on, with Sony and all these other big productions. So uh, God bless him. You know, I, 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 he's a hardworking kid. He makes good money. And um, but, you know, you learn who's who, who, who to work with and who not to work with. I'm just a down to earth kind of guy. I treat everybody, especially my crew. Um, my crew is the most important thing to me on set. Um, I, te I treat them not only with respect, but, but like family, you know, and I have certain people I fly and it costs me a lot more money to do this, but I'll fly people from, you know, Boston to Chicago, to LA, to wherever, <clears throat> because they're my part of my family, you know, they're cameramen or whatever they are. Um, I'm a real close bind with them. You know, and, and a mutual respect with all my my people. And, you know, what I find amazing nowadays is. And what I feel that we're missing in the world today is respect. People just don't respect people. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, uh, being in the UK <clears throat> and I <clears throat> sorry, I've been I've been to the UK numerous times and I love it. Um, I've got some pretty good friends that, that own properties there, you know, and um, um, the problem I have with people nowadays is respect. Nobody, they just say what they want. And, and you know, when I was growing up, you said what you wanted, you got knocked in the mouth, you know, 
Um, nowadays, you can't do that because nowadays you get arrested for it or, you know, the lawsuits or it's, it's a joke. I mean, I've, I've been through six decades now. I mean, I'm 63 years old, just turned. And um, I've seen it all. I mean, you're not going to tell me much that I don't know. I mean, as far as the world goes. And um, there's a lot of people who think they're right about a lot of things. A lot of them think how they want to think, but I know how they are because I lived through it. You know, I, I actually lived and slept and breathed it. So my main thing in life is I, no matter what or who, I treat them with respect unless they, they don't respect me. And if they don't respect me, then they're going to get it back. You know, so. Yeah, I'm sort of like a follow the money guy, you know, who, who stands to gain by ruining our young people. And that's what's sorry, young people, if you're listening, but you, you, <clears throat> you, we, we say you've been shit on from a great height. Yeah. All this social media crap, all yeah. this, you know, I it's get terrible. That. I mean, because, you know, the problem is, is unless you live it or unless you've done it, you don't have a right to speak it. Okay. And especially when it comes to your opinion, everybody's got an opinion. They keep it to themselves because the, the thing about it is, is, and, 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 and you're, you've hit it right on the nose. And I've raised, I got two sons that are, I guess, millennials, you'd say. One's 28, one's 30. Both completely respect. I mean, they respect, trust me, because that was our key in, in, in me bringing them up was you're going to respect me or you're going to get knocked. Okay. And I, I don't give a shit about the laws or the whatever. You know, I, when I grew up, my grandmother, when I, you know, she mainly brought me up when I was a kid. And let me tell you something. She took a wash stick to me. Okay. And I'm talking a walnut wash stick, thick one. Okay. And there was no child abuse then. <laughs> so it was like, I never even knew what child abuse was. I mean, you know, you get these little spanks on the ass and they call it child abuse. And it, it, to me, it's just a joke, man. If you don't, have, if you don't make your kids mind, they're going to end up like a lot of these kids that are out there. I'm not seeing all of them, but there's a lot of just entitled kids, you know? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very, worrisome. If you look at everything in society, just look at it like we don't gain from it. You and I don't gain. I mean, you know, you, I, you it, know what? I, I don't care anymore. I nobody, honestly, I, I go on my life and live my life. I don't get into political shit. Um, I know what I like. You're entitled to like what you like. Just don't talk to me about it. I don't give a shit. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? I, I, I don't. It's all good. Just don't preach to me. It's like religion. Don't preach yes. me to your religion. <clears throat> um, I believe in what I believe in, and that's, that's where the door shuts, you know? And it, it, it really doesn't matter to me. So people get into that shit with me, and I say, hey, it's all good, man, but I don't want to hear it. You know, I'm here to do whatever. You know? So that's yeah. how I keep it. I keep it clean like that, you know? So. Yes, it's a strange, it's a strange life. It gets more, uh, gets stranger as you get older, I think. As you get older, you see it like you. We've seen it. Yeah. We've seen it. And especially growing up in the UK. Okay, I've, I've been there numerous times. I love the UK. I love it. I've been to Cornwall. I've been to, you know, wherever. wherever. <clears throat> but you know the hard knocks because UK has got hard knocks in it, man. I mean, I know some pretty tough guys there, you know. And um, and uh, it's like here. I mean, I, I guess I was considered a tough guy at one time, you know. I collected as a, as a youngster and did a lot of shit I shouldn't have done, but I did. But it, it doesn't matter. It's how I lived. That's how I survived. But let me tell you something. A lot of people think there's so much freedom. You know, there, there's no freedom here in the U.S., boy. Take you back to U.K. and, and, and try to pull some of the shit you pull here and see what happens. You know? Or in, in any of these other countries. I've been to numerous countries. You go to Asia or something, man, you're in deep trouble. I mean, they'll, they'll kill you there. You have a joint on you now in, in Asia that you put you to death. Yeah. I mean, it's legal here in California. Okay, so you can smoke here. You take it with you on a plane to, to China. You go, to, they'll put you to death. You know, 
or jail for the rest of your life. So, yeah, you can tell someone in Thailand to uh, f off, and and if you make yeah. this, make someone lose face, they they'll run you over in their car. And, and oh yeah, they don't care. Yeah, it's, nobody will ever know. It doesn't happen often, fortunately. But I I, I saw a guy take a real real beating in uh, Koh Phan Yang one, yeah. one, one time and uh, yeah he, he, ju- he just upset the local he just said the wrong thing and they didn't you can't do that you can't go and it's, it's like me when I go into these prisons okay I go into these prisons with these prisoners I obviously did time years ago so I understand the mentality okay it's all about respect like I was saying I don't go into those prisons and act like Mr. Hollywood, okay? I go into those prisons with my mindset in how I was when I was inside and how I wanted to be treated. And I'll tell you this, in Chicago, which is, you know, notorious for crime, um, those people love me what I call in their house. And I actually was in the cages. I was actually in the prison cells. We had guys rapping with us. Um, when I left, I bought the whole prison pizza, which they don't get the, the food there is shit. Okay. Green bologna. Okay. And it, and I mean, good pizza, not Domino's. I'm talking good pizza from an Italian place there And Chicago has got some of the best pizza ever. Okay. So when I came back to do a reshoot, they were like, holy shit, you know, thanking me. I'm like, hey, guys, you don't have to thank me. You, you invited me into your house. The least I could do is buy you guys dinner. And I bought all the men and women prisoners their pizza. And, and, and it wasn't a cheap task, but it was a, my gift to them for letting me in their house. You know what I mean? And that, that, that's all about respect. So when I go back to do reshoots, they love seeing us. They love talking to us. We... You know, if they get out, we actually, they can text us and we'll help them out if they need a, a pair of shoes or uh, whatever. We, we, we still stay in t- contact with a lot of these guys getting out to help them for extra counseling. Even though we're not counselors, we just talk to them as friends and whatever we can do to help them. You know, that's what our whole game is, you know, is giving it back, you know. I'm guessing that you think, prison should be rehabilitation rather than just the punishment? Well, you know what? Here's the deal. You've got your hardened criminals, which you're not going to rehabilitate. Most of them. Um, I'll say at least 90, 90%, 95. But then you got your nonviolent criminals, okay? There's a lot of that going on that the laws are different, they shouldn't even be in there for the amounts of times they're in there. It's just basically the city laws. But at the same time, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the uh, reform programs in like Germany or in Denmark or wherever, um, Switzerland, they actually train these guys inside. The, they have classes, whether mechanics, woodworking, welding, whatever. They actually are training them inside to, 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 so when they get released, they can get a job on the outside. See, prison is a business. They don't want you up till this point. They don't want you to reform. They want you to go out, go back in the revolving door. Their prison makes a fuckload of money. Oops, sorry about that. A ton of money. Mm-hmm. And it's just a process. And they don't want, now it's starting to get a little bit out there of how it works. Now, the whole reason why I'm doing the show I'm doing, The Prisoner's Path, is because I'm gonna show people what the reality is behind reform and how it can be successfully done. And we're not just doing it one way, we're actually doing it a few different ways. We're actually lucky to be able to film uh, up in Oregon, they are doing the European way, where they're training people prior to getting out, they give them therapy inside, they give them therapy when they get out, somebody to talk to and they get and, and, and they get them a job. Now that's what's been missing in this whole queue the whole time for all these years. It's like, how easy would have that have been, been to do billions and billions of dollars back instead of paying these prisons to keep these prisoners, which cost what a million, two million a year. Some of them are hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
for one prisoner? Why don't you put a reform programs inside? They work them inside in like Unicor, okay? And they're, they're making, the, they're working these guys for pennies on the dollar, okay? And then they're making furniture for the state offices and shit, and nobody can compete with those prices. So now they got basically slave labor inside the prisons, okay, in California. And I know this for a fact, because I was there. Um, and I had a job. I was a milker at the dairy. OK, so um, you basically have the, you, these guys that are making 12 cents an hour or whatever it is, some stupid amount. And they're actually doing a trade inside, but yet they're not getting paid for it. And then the government or the, the, the Unicor, what they call it, is not a Fed. It's not. It, those are privately owned by, by governors. OK, those businesses, which is I don't know how they pull that off. OK, the commissaries are owned and supplied by private entities like, you know, Keefe Foods, who is owned by, from what I understand, the Bush family. OK, and it's just a zoo of money and billions and trillions of dollars within this system. So instead of helping these guys and reforming these guys inside. And I'm not saying all of them, because there's that's, that's what we're, we're doing is there are prisons that have these reforms. And that's what we're about. That's what we're trying to show is the good side to these guys. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, you got guys in there, to, you know, getting bust for 900 plants a pot, okay, in California back, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it was. These guys are doing 25 years. Well, pot's legal in California. You can go buy it at any store in the corner now, you know? And why are they still there? Why, what's, what am I missing? You know what I mean, right? These weren't hardened criminals, so it's just a it's it, it's a it's a cycle that needs to be fixed. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, we could talk forever about the Bush fa- the Bush cri- crime family. <laughs> um, you know, they the, the, they're responsible for quite. Well, they a bit own shit. numerous. Like I said, the Keefe Foods is owned by Barbara Bush's family uh, on her side, I believe. So, and they yeah. supply all the prisons. They supply all the commissary food that the prisoners buy from the commissary yeah it was the same in uh, uh, iraq wasn't it they 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 owned all the contracts for the soldiers and the the oh uh, uh, yeah the, 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 iraq the re- reconstruction all that gold came up missing all the money came up missing yeah billions of dollars in cash yes exactly was it never six, found it six trillion or something ridiculous yeah, some was it? From, from, from the cash. pentagon um yes um, no, how you're obviously a very well balanced, well rounded guy now, but I, I'd imagine coming from foster home background, that must have been tough. Well, did you, did, you, you, you said you spent a bit of time inside. Yeah. Did you, were you like me? Did you go down the drugs route or, or, or have problems there? Well, you know, I'm sure you, I don't know your background, but if you're anything like me, I, as a kid, as a foster kid, I had PTSD as a kid. Okay. Um, I did go down the drug path, but not hard. I, uh, I kind of didn't really, you know, I smoked a lot of pot when I was a kid, you know? Um, but then I got to the point one time where I just didn't like it no more. You know, I've always had that, that strong will to pretty much get over, which I'm lucky. Okay. Um, get over things. Now, in the 80s, it was a lot of coke and drugs of that nature. And, you know, I was involved in that stuff. Um, And that was another hurdle that I got over. Um, But I did it on my own. I didn't go to rehab or whatever. I jumped on a plane. I sold everything I had. I jumped on a plane. I went to the Bahamas. And I worked out with this big bohemian guy who kicked my ass every day working out and sweat that poison right out. And when I got done, I come back to L.A., I was cold turkey. I think, this, you know, there's no secret in, in, in quitting drugs or anything else. And you'll probably tell me I'm right, I hope, on this. If you don't hang out with those kind of people that you're doing it with all the time or you're around it, you're not going to do it. Okay. Unless you're a really powerless person 
Everybody's got the power in themselves to stop anything or do anything they want. Okay. That's a fact. Okay. And I'm a proven concept of that. You know, um, I'm no angel. Uh, you know, I've done shit in the past many, many years ago, but I learned from it, you know, and I, that's what life's about. Learn it, learn, fail and, and, and error, you know, and, and from that, if you take the lessons from that, then you learn. If you don't, you're going to stay a dumb fuck your whole life, you know, as I'll say. And the thing I can tell the younger kids today is do research on things. Don't just listen to all this shit you're hearing on Instagram, and Twitter, and Facebook, and all this crap. It, it's, it's, you, what they're trying to do now and what they do is they program people to not think a certain way. And basically, that's called communism, as you know. And that's where our, our world is intertwined in right now. It's they want to control the minds, control how you think, and that it's not good to do certain things, which is bullshit. Okay. Now, I overcame my PTSD. I still have certain moments, but not bad. Um, I overcame that on my, my own. And, you know, one of the biggest things I've learned in life is to quit hating things. Um, because when you hate things, it just, it's a drawing. And it just, you know, I used to get so pissed off and, and uh, you know, somebody would screw me on a deal and I'd fucking tell them I'd go beat them up or I'm going to get you or just dumb shit, you know, that, that gets you in trouble. And um, I just learned a long time ago to put that shit aside and say, you know what? It is what it is. Move on to the next thing. And just you learn from this, you know, you learn from this and then you're going to learn not to do it again. You'll do it again because I fucked up many times. In life. But at the same time, you know, you got you got good cons and you got bad cons. And, and, and that's just part of life. And, and you get sucked into stuff sometimes. And what all you can do is you lick your wounds on the on the way out and and mm -hmm. and come back bigger and stronger. You know, I I've, I've been sued a few times. I've won, you know, but and and I, you know, I've I've lost only by default on one one thing, but didn't make it right, you know. Um, but people know how to use the system now, and that's what they do. You know, people utilize the system in bad ways. And um, that's what you got to watch out for. Yeah. So I learned my lessons like that. I, I don't preach to anybody. I don't tell anybody how to do anything. I'll give them some advice if they want advice. And I'll tell them, hey, this is how it is. I know because I've lived it. I've been there, done it. And, and I know it. And I know it well. And I know what the outcome is going to be. You know? But other than that, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't hate anybody. Like I met my mother when I was 12 years old or no, 10 years old. And, uh, I never, you know, she deserved me as a baby one years old. I think I was in six foster homes by the time I was uh, six years old, but you know, I didn't hold any, I, you know, back then I, I was rebellious and I, I had put a lot of hate in me. And I was a mixed up kid. And I, but I went on my own when I was 13 because I just didn't like living with her. And there was all these other kids she had, my half brothers and sisters. And uh, there was 12 of us all, all together. So it was a packed house, you know. And um, I just went on my own when I was 13, doing various jobs and, and um, got back to California when I was just turned 17, I guess. And uh, I met my father then. And my father was a professional jockey, which is a really funny story because, you know, I'm not a short guy. I mean, I'm pretty big. Um, I used to be even bigger when I was younger, but uh, because I trained a lot and stuff. They, but, they, didn't they call you the pit, the pit bull? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, well, I, there was a reason for that. I mean, was, I was a collector when I was, you know, I used to collect for organizations back in the day. So I, I was not a nice guy. You didn't want to piss me off. But um, 
I met my father. My father was a famous jockey at one time, which is funny because he's a little guy. He's a little teeny guy. And, um, you know, one thing I loved about my father, and I didn't know him that long. You know, he passed away many, many years ago. But I got to spend a few years with him, a couple of years with him. And we'd go drinking. He was a fun drinking buddy. buddy. He couldn't always liquor. He's a little guy. I used to have to carry him over my shoulder and walk him down the street and throw him in his bed. You know, it's funny because he, he's a little guy, you know. Like he, you know, I was named after Lyle Seacrest, who was a famous racehorse driver or, or you know, jockey. And then they all were, you know, buddies with Shoemaker and all these famous jockeys. So that's that, that was my dad's life. My dad's family were all thoroughbred racehorse people out of Washington State. So I really, I really, you know, my dad didn't try to, like my mother, you know, she came up with all these excuses and blame and whatever. And my father didn't do that. He didn't get into it. He didn't try to say, hey, you know, I'm sorry I pissed you to the side or whatever. It's like, hey, I'm, you know, fucking human. I fucked up and hmm. here I am. And it's like, you know what? I like that. I, I'd like rather have you be honest than the bullshit. You know what I mean? So we got along fine, you know, and, uh, I, I had a good time for him. I actually miss my father because he was actually a lot of fun when I was around him. Um, but um, I, you know, that kind of installed, instilled things to me. It's like, I think in life, the best thing is to just tell the truth to people. You know, don't, don't bullshit people because you're going to, they're going to find out anyway. You know, you, I mean, shit comes around, you know what I mean? And, um, and um, it's always better to just be straight shooter, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's it, like when I was a kid, I wish I had guys like you and me around. Yeah. No, no one told me shit when I was a yeah, kid. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. No guidance. They no just guidance. told me stupid shit. Like, you know, I mean, it really was. Well, no. And just being told to obey things all the time, you know, be, yeah. be quiet and obey. Well, yeah, that's fine. If it's someone that deserves your respect, but if it's some, you know, some system or some institution or some idiot, yeah. it's just yeah. led us down a, a path of, of now everyone's so compliant. They just uh, go along with everything. And, and yeah. it's, it's, um, it's very frightening. It, I mean, you, your kids are grown up. My, my, my lads, he's just, you know, he's very young still. And, and yeah. I'm, I, I, uh, fortunately there's, there's quite a few people out there. I think they understand, you know, that I think they understand life and what's going on and they're starting to take a stand about it, but I don't know, you know, I don't know how successful they will. Well, we'll be. see. I, I got, I got to tell you something. I think at the end of the day, um, I don't, I honestly, there's a lot of people that just sit back and don't say anything. And, and you know, I'm in Hollywood and, and I know a lot of people. And like I said, it's real political here in, in, in California, especially. Um, and there's a lot of people I know that just sit back and they don't say anything either because we don't, honestly, we know what to do. We just don't want to start any fires. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the best way to be, you know, stay neutral. And uh, and uh, you got to do what you got to do when you got to do it. That's why I look at it. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, but you guys are gonna lucky. Challenge me, they're going to challenge the wrong person. You know? you're, you're lucky, though. You still have the right to bear arms. They've they've taken that away from us over here. Well, they're trying to do that here. Yeah, you. I, can, I get it. I, I it won't think. happen. It won't happen. I see, I see, Let me I explain see. something to you. They try that shit here, man, and they're going to have a major problem. Yeah. Not only that, they're trying to take all the, they're, they're trying to uh, cut the budgets on the police, all, all kinds of shit, stupid shit. And, and here's the deal. And I have several officers that I know. Okay. I, I deal with sheriffs and in my shows. They're great guys, man. I mean, I, I deal with a lot of good people that have been shot at and, all kinds of crazy shit. And either, if these people, and they get this little trendy thing, oh, you know, cops are bad. Well, there's some bad ones, but there's a lot, the good ones outweigh the bad ones. You know what I mean? And what they do do is they protect us. Okay. Now you take that shit away and see what happens. Hmm. 
Okay. You take that shit away and see what happens. You're going to have every criminal there is raping, pillaging, robbing, and you name it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. And it, 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 people here, they won't put up that shit. I mean, um, I won't put up that shit. You know, you, you, you want to come play with me, you better bring a bigger gun than mine. And I got some big ones. Here, so, um, you know. Yeah. No, can I ask you something? I don't know what, yeah. what your take is on this, but what about all the, what I would call esoteric Hollywood? All this sit, uh, the, all this symbolism that you see the 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 actors are doing and the celebrities and the, the oh, pop stars. You mean stars by, by getting political or? No, or? I. I mean, it's almost like a sort of followers see, following like the masks shit. And, well, no, I, I mean, I mean, like this. It's almost like a, a sort of quasi Masonic cult that that's that people seem to jo join, and they're always doing this stuff. And 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 oh, I you know what? Honestly, I don't. <laughs> I haven't really seen a lot of it. Probably now that you said it, you know, I'll look for it. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of that stuff around, and there is. Um, I think it's it it it, it it's uh, weird shit, you know. I mean, I don't get involved in it, and uh, but there's a lot of it. There's a lot of secret societies and stuff, you know, that. Uh, have a lot of weird shit going on, but that's been going on for years, man. That's nothing new. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the elite is protected, you know, in a sense. And, and if it gets exposed, they use one sacrifice. It's almost like, you know, you watch these movies, they sacrifice a body or whatever, same shit, you know, I mean, look what they've done to, you know, some of these top, People in Hollywood, they fed them to the wolves to evade the um, focus on others, yeah. you know, and yeah, it's a, it's a bad thing. I mean, fortunately for me, um, I've always been a pretty stand up guy and yeah, everybody got crazy in the eighties and nineties and, you know, it's not like it is now in this whole acting thing, the producing thing. Um, and it was a lot different, you know, um, there was a lot of things that, that you could do that you can't even do now, which is another big control factor, um, nowadays, you know, it's almost like an extortion type thing. You know what I mean? Where you got to watch what you do and what you say and who you say it to, and, you know, back in the day, you didn't have that problem. You know, now everybody sues everybody and it's just, you know, it's just gotten out of control. You know, I mean, that's what I'm going to say to that. I mean, I, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of watch what I say and do and behind closed doors, I do whatever I want to do. You know? So mm -hmm. I don't put it out there. You know, you don't ever see me really put my life out on social media that that amazes me right there is how people put their shit out on social media all the time you know they're they're what's happening to them and you know uh, all this stuff i'm like you know dude suck it up you know i mean i don't get it i don't you know it, and all it is is a sympathy card to me and I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. You know? Yeah. Um, you got to advertise that. your life out there. That's kind of silly, you know? I've said this a lot. If I wasn't in the media or, you know, an author, there's no way I'd have a Twitter account or an Instagram. I, I, I The notion that other okay. people want to see my shit is just, it's okay. Maybe if you had five mates and you all loved, say, running triathlons and you wanted to, you, you, yeah okay po possibly but but you know this is me walking on the beach this is me 
eating my oh, din- dinner. This is my child at one years old. It, and it, <clears throat> it, it's, yeah, it's silly. It, I find it really, really strange. I've only got yeah, social media. I mean, I used to, <clears throat> I used to once in a while <clears throat> on my, on my Instagram or whatever, like do a challenge or show myself hiking or once in a while or something like that health wise. But I don't even do that anymore. I mean, it's mm-hmm. been forever, long time. You know, I might, I might uh, show a dinner out once in a while, but I don't really talk about my personal life and I don't show it. And I don't, like I said, most of the stuff I post is business related, you know, for promotion of a project. I don't really get into it. And, and it's funny because I spend no time on Facebook. I mean, in fact, even Messenger, when we talk, me and you talk, um, we talk privately. We don't really talk on the, as you know, on the mm. face of shit. Um, um, I don't really go in there maybe once, once or once every other day or two days or three days. I, I, I you know, I don't, that's why if I don't get back to somebody, they get pissed off or whatever, which I don't give a fuck, you know, I don't care. Um, I just don't go on this shit. If you, if you got my email, email me. If you got my phone number, text me or whatever. If you want to get a hold of me. Other than that, I don't go on that social media stuff. I got three different Facebook accounts. I've got, or more than that, because I got one for street, one for skin fly, one for, you know, all this bullshit prison stuff. So I got about 10, actually, eight or 10. Um, and then I got several Instagrams because of the different shows and personal, which I can't even get into now. Um, mm-hmm. So I use skin flies uh, most of the time. And other than that, I, I don't do, you know, I don't do the thing. I don't care because, and I don't get into it with people. I don't have waste my fucking time with ignorance. You know what I mean? So I'd rather say nothing. Yes. Lyle, how is, so how has Netflix affected the industry? Has, 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 has there been changes but, in that respect? I, I mean, I, I kind of like Netflix. I mean, I know one of the head guys, um, you know, hey, it's fair game, man. You know, I, I think they're geniuses. I think they they started something. It's a monster now. Um, I think that it's a better platform than the studio deals. Um, studios, I mean, I've done numerous films and had numerous things distributed. I've had things in theaters where I've self-released myself um, because when you do a deal with a lot of the majors, um, you never see any money. And that's been going on for years and years and years and years. So with the Netflix or, or a Amazon or whoever, they, I mean, they got to write some good checks up front. They, they pay you, you, you make good money. Um, it's not like that old system where they're taking, you know, 30% of this from you, you know, cause a typical studio deal, you know, they're taking what, 25, 30% of, of whatever, and then they'll distribute something. Um, and then you might see money or you might not ever. And even if the film, for instance, a good for instance is um, the first Batman done made over a billion dollars. Okay. The producers on that show never saw a cent and they had kept points. And it was because the studio said, well, it costs this much for, theaters and this much and the, the prices just keep the debts just get added and that and that and that system doesn't work and it, 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 it works for the studios they get rich and wealthy and make all the money so that's what's good about i think netflix and amazon and uh, apple and all these you know different hulu and is you actually make your money you know what i mean you get money and yeah. for indie producers it's a it's it's a huge break you know what I mean? It's like my network uh, that I'm a partner on Bayer. Uh, we don't do exclusive contracts. We do non-exclusive. So you can air, and Martin actually has a show up on, on, on our network. Um, you, you can view your stuff and, you know, it's a nice split. It's a 70-30 split. Every quarter you get paid in your account. And now, can can you shout out the name of your network? Just remind me. It's 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 Vire V Y R E Network dot com. Yes, and, uh, I I've yeah. watched it because I watched um, I saw Martin, Martin yeah. Martin's 
friends Docu- on with about- documentary. Yeah, yeah, incredible, huh? Yeah, so you can watch for free, and and we have the apps, and you can actually download the smart app on your smart TV with that watchfire.com. And it's it's clean, man. You make money, and for any filmmakers, you know, sometimes you don't even get a deal, you know, as, as a lot of these people know. So if you put it on our platform, you make whatever people watch. You, you make the streams, you know, you get paid by streams. So it's until you get a better deal, say, say you're streaming on us, you're in 115 countries. We might be a little more now, but we've survived all the startups. We actually bypassed a lot of these companies that started out bigger than us and they're out of business now and we're still in business and we're going strong and we're making money, you know? So um, our whole thing is, is we don't want to own your project. See, that's the problem with the studios. You know, they take your project or most distributors, they want to take 10, 10 year, take your project for 10 years and own it and license it out and make all this money that you're not seeing. And that's what's in my opinion was wrong with the studio system where Netflix is boom. They're straight deals. You make it's an indie filmmaker's dream come true. As far as I'm concerned, it's hard to get studio deals anymore. And honestly, why? I don't know why you would. You know, and I'm not saying that in a bad way to the studios. I'm just saying there's so much, so much overhead in studios that it's like that's why you're not seeing any money sometimes. Yeah. I mean, not every deal's like that, but I can tell you I've heard and experienced them myself that it's easier to do. Everybody wants that studio name, you know, behind their film. But nowadays, you don't even need it. Nowadays, Netflix is just as big or you go to do a deal with Lionsgate, and, um, you know, Netflix or they do joints or however. It, 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 you know, like I said, I've self-released where I... I've paid for my own theaters. And, and the whole secret to that is you have to release it in certain cities, okay? And you do a limited release on your indie film. And then what you do is then you go to Netflix. Once you do your limited release in those certain cities, there's 10 of them, 8 to 10, and they'll, they'll pick your, your project up if it's decent, you know? And you'll get some good money. I mean, you know, I think you've got to think, and, and people don't understand this, is, you know, I get – film packages brought to me all the time with these stupid budgets to them, um, with these actors that, you know, I'm going to say aren't worth their money anymore, you know? Um, and I'm going to say that in a nice way. Um, but the budgets are like these stupid budgets and these people come to you and go, Oh, well, we got such and such. And we got this guy and we got that guy. And he's an award winning, you know, he won a war. Yeah. What? 25 years ago, you know, when he was hot, now he's getting five grand a, you know, picture, you know, and people don't understand that these, these, some of these amateur filmmakers and, and I, and I'm not knocking them. I, I got to give them kudos for trying to get something done and getting out there and, you know, doing whatever, but there's a right way and a wrong way. And you need to learn what people are worth and what they're not. And because when you go for a distribution deal, that counts. Now, if you go for a distribution deal and the distributor says, hey, I'll give you 100 grand for this and it costs you a million bucks, you're in deep trouble because you're never going to see that million bucks back. And another thing that's important <clears throat> for filmmakers, and I'll give my little secret out, you might probably already know this, is tax laws. Here in California, in the U.S., you have the 181, you have the 161, and you have, there's one other one, I forget what it is. Those three tax laws are very important for any film filmmakers because if you've got stuff shot, the 181, the investor can get 100% of his, his investment back in write-off. And then he doesn't have to pay taxes on anything until he starts recoup, recouping pro- profit. Okay. Now, once you do start recouping profit, you hit the 161 and you can get 20% off your profit. See, so there's, there's a lot of things that indie filmmakers need to learn to get their money. And if they know that if they do their homework and they learn these tax laws, 
It's wonderful. People give you money because you know why? They're not really losing it. They need to write off anyway. They'll write off 100%. They're not losing anything. And when they do start making money, then they're going to start pay, paying taxes. But then you got another tax law that gives them 20% off the profits. See? So there's a lot to learn. I learned the hard way. I learned the right ways of how to take care of investors. And, um, you know, I finance a lot of stuff myself, um, mostly in-house stuff. I, I don't, I mean, I do do a few things out, outside, which I've got a couple things out right now, but they're still within my company. And, you know, I produced them and put the money up to finish them and stuff. So, but indie filmmakers, they're, you know, they just need to know how to take advantage of different things and, and educate themselves and they'll be successful from the get go and know what they're talking about when they go after money or pitch to somebody like me that knows the value of actors and budget. You understand it has to match. If it doesn't match, you're done. Yeah, I bet. Do you, you must have heard of William Morris agency. Of course. Yeah. They're, they're like the one of the, one of the biggest agencies in Hollywood. Five. Yeah. yeah, they they approach me for the rights to my first memoir. Wow. Um, but then I must also say that I've had about 10 Hollywood agents ask me now about the rights for my memoir. It got to the point where I just got fed up with them asking me because nothing ever came of it. Um, it was like they were fishing a bit, but I don't know what they were fishing for. Do you think? Um, well, sometimes what happens is they take your memoir and they steal from it and they do their own watered down version. Yeah. Of stuff. Yeah. Do you think there could be, there should be something I could be exploring through Netflix with my memoir? It's an incredible. I mean, I have to see it. You know what I mean? I, I mean, Jason is an award winning writer. I mean, he used to do all Seagal. He was an in-house writer for Steven Seagal at one time. And his father, he grew up. I mean, he's a phenomenal writer. He's been mentored, and was mentored and studied under some of the best writers out there. Um, and he's, you know, I've known him half most of his life. And um, he reads stuff. He does, he does diligence. and He's amazing. I got to just say, he's an amazing guy. I'm lucky to have somebody in-house. He's like a brother anyway, but um, that's so smart. I mean, because he does shit I don't do, you know, and uh, he's smarter than me that way. I can say that. Um, so, you know, if you get it to me, I'd let him look at it and then shoot back and forth, see what, what we think, and he's smart. And then if, from that point, Maybe it's something we develop on our own in-house, you know, and then take it to Netflix. Maybe we do, you know, it just depends. It depends on budget. It depends on uh, what it is. I don't know what it is, you know, obviously. So, Yeah, let's talk about that. That could That'd be, be good. You know, you have my... my well, my... Email, you know. Yeah, I, I won't bore you now with my memoir, but... Um, yeah. let's no, just, I better not to because I won't focus. You know. yeah. yeah. But let's just say... Did you ever see the film Midnight Express about the, oh, yeah. the one president? Of my one of my favorites. Yeah. The guy in Turkey, right? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. They don't make films like that anymore. Oh, no. That was a, that was an insane. And that was based on a true story. Yeah. But yeah. Um, that was one of, that's one of my favorite films. That and Shad Shock Resumption. Yeah, yeah exactly. They don't make films like that anymore. Yeah. Well, my memoir is that it would make that wow. kind of film, right? It's set in, I mean, I lived in, I lived in Hong Kong. Um, and yeah, it would really make a good film, which is a, which is why I think maybe no one has picked it up because it actually would make a good film. And now they don't seem to want to make good films. They want to make nah, it's garbage, a lot of garbage. Yeah. A lot of garbage. Now. And, and remakes. They remake films and they're not even... Yeah, they remake of... films and they, they, they use the same storylines all the time. Yeah. So what's been... Um, how, how I, I should ask you, 
when you see the credits at the end of a movie, it's phenomenal the amount of people. Yeah. It's just phenomenal. How how do you manage all that? What was it like? What I mean, obviously you don't work with all of them, but but, but but I mean, what's it like trying to just be involved in that a project of that scale? Well, and I've had it. I mean, um, you actually do meet quite a few people sometimes if you if you uh, are on the set and you are a real producer. I mean, you know me. I'm I'm always hands on. So, um, I mean, pretty much that goes to the editor. You know, uh, and that it's it's a job of a production assistant or PA. To, you know, you have to have sign offs. You have to have different contracts, and that all they have to keep track of all that stuff. And and there's lists. I mean, I've it's been a nightmare for me actually doing that uh, prior uh, titles and stuff. Mm. And we probably missed a couple at one point or another. You know, um, no fault of ours, but just you're in such a hurry to get that shit done sometimes that, you know, last minute stuff comes in and you're already lock cut the film and you're like, well, fuck, we can't add another title in there, another credit. I mean, you know, we didn't know this guy was there and, you know, that was up to his boss to get his name in there. If it's not there, then how do we freaking know, you know? So, you know, a lot of that crap goes on behind the, the scenes, and, but yeah, no, you're right. There's a zillion credits man and and i try to get them all i mean that's why i i have extensive documents on all my films especially sign ups, especially uh like in prison every every inmate we have on camera we get sign ups from the inmates which is pretty bizarre um because we use them you, you can't just put their face on 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 tv or film you know you have to have their permission People don't understand that. You know, you can't just go film some people and put them on stuff. So, <clears throat> but that, yeah, that's a, that's a good subject. I mean, and my answer for it is sometimes some shit slips through the cracks, you know, <laughs> but yeah. I, like I said, I'm on the set. So I kind of have a pretty good memory. Although when it comes to editing, I'm kind of focused on the whole project, not really names, but I'll go through it sometimes and look at the credits and if there's something missing that I know of, I'll, I'll say something, you know, I've done that before actually, because mm -hmm. I'm pretty hands-on. I mean, I'm pretty, you know, my stuff, I, I make sure I watch everything from first beginning to end. You know? So on my stuff, not so much on there's other stuff though that, yeah, there's people, I know people that have been in stuff that didn't get on the credits. You know, it's funny. Um, yeah. Not for them, but, and what's it like living over there in California? Are you are you actually in Hollywood? Yep. I'm in Hollywood right now. It's where my office is, on Gower and Santa Monica. Wow. In the midst of Hollywood. And behind me, if you go out in the parking lot, the Hollywood sign is right there. Oh, well, here. I'll show you something. Here you go. There's Hollywood right there. Yeah, See? there it is. That's the sign, and that's... Right in back of me, there's a little piece of my office here. It's a really nice office. We got a full bar over there in the corner. <laughs> Some of the best scotch you'll ever have. <laughs> That's important for me. I'm a good scotch drinker. Um, so, I, I mean, people come to our office and um, they love it because, you know, you have, you have a cocktail there in a meeting or whatever. It's kind of Hollywood, you know, I guess you say, or we go to a, a restaurant down on what they call Larchmont is a lot of uh, restaurants down there. Trendy place, you know. Do you, um, do you see many of the, what, what, what they would call stars? Do you see them around oh yeah, town? All the time, all the time in here. Oh yeah. I mean, they're doing inside my building. They're doing Netflix shows, uh, uh, Warner brothers shows. They're all in here. And, and, but you know, it's funny because I really, honestly, I don't pay attention to that shit anymore. You know, I, I, I'm my own guy. I mean, I'm, kind of one of those guys, I guess you say, but I don't really, it doesn't impress me anymore. It's just, you know, unless I'm working with them or whatever, I really don't, you know, I might walk by them in the hallway here. Or, hey, how you doing? You know, whatever, you know, but I don't, 
it's no big deal to me. Anymore. It's mm. no, you know, it's not like I stop and say, Hey dude, I got a script for you. I mean, I, you know, I don't do that. I, I kind of just, I mean, if they approach me, then great. But if, you know, I get approached here by certain people, but, um, which is fine because then it's legit. I don't have to mess with their agents all the time, but until it's negotiating time or whatever, but, um, or unless they have their own production company, which a lot of these guys do, and then I don't have to deal with that shit at all. You know? mm-hmm. So that's how my lawyers you know, deal with. I have a law firm that works for me. So, you know, that's kind of it. Yeah. You know? Um, anyway. Yeah. No, I just, before we, before we say our goodbyes, I just want to say thank you to Martin Webster. Oh yeah, Martin's and, a good guy. Man. And Mark, yeah, Mark, Mark, Martin's Mark been through Ryan. a lot. You know, Martin's been through a lot. You know, and and I respect the fact that he's overcome what he's done. Uh, you know, with PTSD and stuff, and he's gotten his message out there, and he's helped a lot of. I feel he's helped a lot of people. You know, his his show, his movies helped a lot of people, and. Um, I, I, it'd be a good thing to watch. Go up to fire and watch it. You know, mm. so. I went to the premiere of his latest movie the other day. Yeah, I haven't seen that yet, but I heard from from I, you know he sends it to me, and honestly, I I get so busy. Honestly, I can't watch everything all the time. No, but, um, um, there's not enough time in the day because I got my own stuff going. I'm looking at editing. People don't understand that. And Mark's a really cool guy. I, I, I you know, I got no nothing but love for him. But you know, Mark actually told me Ryan he saw it and he said he was really good. He said it was really really good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it when I get a chance. I just haven't had time. I've been flying. You know, I don't. Sometimes I don't even know what day it is. You know, I'm <laughs> flying from here to there and different places all the time. So it's like, you know, I only got so many hours in the yeah. day. I got to sleep at least two, three hours to stay normal, you know? So I'm the same people. Very often people send me a link to watch a video and I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't have an hour and a half in my day to watch some. I mean, I, I might just have a quick look at it, but yeah, um, I don't, I don't have enough time for my own stuff, let alone. Yeah. That's, just, that's, that's it. Yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, so uh, Martin Webster, thank you, and and you're, yeah. you you know Mark Ryan quite well, very well. Good good buddy of mine, good buddy. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, he's been in my film. So very talented actor, very well. I mean, you know, he's famous. I mean, he's he's a famous guy. I mean, he's done did the uh, uh, what do you call it the uh, uh, the voiceover. The Trans- Transformers. Yeah. There's all the Transformers uh, voices, a lot of them. He's, he's just a talented guy. He's a great actor. It, it, I'll, I'll say this. He's a great mate to drink with. <laughs> me, and him, me and him have, have our scotches together. and uh, I hope he doesn't mind that. I don't think he does. He's a pretty cool guy. But uh, he's my mate, as you call it. Uh, one of my mates. You know? So, yeah. Just don't don't lend him any money. You you'll never get it back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that. No, listen. Um, s- stay on the Zoom chat after I hit the record button off, just so I can thank you properly. Oh, okay, no problem. Um, but while we're still recording, just massive thank you to you. It's it's just amazing for someone sat over here in the UK to even have a. a a little bit of an insight into what goes on in Hollywood and to have it from such, such yeah, it's, it's, it's not, it's much different than there. I mean, I've been both places, so. Yeah. And to have, to hear it from such a great guy, it's, um, Uh, I hope hope, hope that great. There's a lot more greater guys than me, put it that way. But uh, you know, I'll give it to you how it is, you know? So. Yeah. Well, great and and humble. I'm going to say. Thank you. So, Yes, Lyle, please. Thank you ever so much. Um, Just stay on the line while I say goodbye to our friends at home. Massive love to you all, folks. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, as much as I have. I went to my first red carpet premiere for Martin's Do the other day. And uh, yeah, I feel um, incredibly honoured to just to to know these guys. Um, So if you have enjoyed it, if you can like and subscribe, And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care.